of how the the assignments and things were handed in. Um, I think the class average was around 85. Um, the only reason why people didn't do it or why people didn't get perfect um, is one, everyone usually messed up on the same question. Uh, th this is about the assignment, by the way, um, for the first unit is that uh, people used, so some people use derivatives as a way to um, solve for the tangent. You shouldn't, that, that's the next unit. That's the second unit. That's the unit we're doing right now. You can't use things you used in the second unit for the first unit. It wouldn't make any sense because the second unit is all about using a shortcut. The first unit is all about using first principles, using a limit. So you can only use using a limit to determine a tangent, right? In the second unit, you can use derivatives, but you can't use derivatives in the first unit, okay? Um, okay, so yeah, we are continuing with, uh, we are learning how to do derivatives, right? So we kind of uh, did applications and calculus last time. Right. Um, OK, so we were kind of doing this question, right? How about we redo this again, but a bit more clearly? Uh, we'll kind of um, try to understand this a bit more in a better way. Yeah, maybe here. So. Yeah. So for example, here we have the position of a moving object on a line is given by st equals 60 squared minus t cubed, right? So I'll go through how we would answer this and then you'll try to answer other application questions, okay? So remember, position. Position is relative, so it's kind of like, the displacement relative to a point, right? That's a position. Like for example, when we talk about position on earth, we're relating it to the entire earth, right? And then we kind of gave it uh, the North Pole as like the origin, right? And then we use latitude and longitude to uh, figure out a specific location on earth, right? So for example, this is for an example, right? And so that's what position is described as, right? And position of an object on a moving line is described by this equation, right? This function, right? And so we can think of this as just the standard, uh, you know how I said displacement, velocity, and acceleration are all derivatives of each other, right? So we can think of position as just y, right? We can think of velocity as the derivative of position. It's the change in y over the change in time, right? And so position, these are all like vectors, but since this is a calculus class, I don't want you to think about uh, vectors. I guess it's not that important. So then we also have acceleration, right? Acceleration is the change in y, right, over the change in time, right? This is the derivative of velocity, right? You don't have to, so this is all in relation to position. You just have to know that the derivative, the derivative of position is velocity, the derivative of velocity is acceleration, okay? So we are going from, position to velocity. Determine the velocity and acceleration of the object at t equals two. So to take the velocity using the position, it's telling you right here, you have to take the derivative of y with respect to t, right? So you have the function st equals 60 squared minus t, t to the power of three. And this is basically just a restriction that t must be greater than or equal to zero, which makes sense. You can't have negative time. Right? So now that we're trying to find velocity, we need to take the derivative of st or s prime t, right? So s prime t, we can use a couple of rules, right? 
we can use the difference rule, right? We could also use the power rule. And that's essentially it. All you have to do is use the, uh, the constant multiple rule, right? There's the constant multiple rule, the power rule, and the difference rule. That's it. And then another power rule over here. That's it, right? So there's three rules in this, three derivative rules. So the difference rule says you have to split it into two parts, 6t squared and t cubed. So focus on 6t squared first. You have a constant here, so you can just leave that. So 6. Now the power rule says you move this exponent as the coefficient and you subtract this uh, exponent by one, right? So you have times two t to the power of two minus one, which is just one. So you finish the first part. Now you can move on to the second. Constant multiple rule says you could treat this as negative one. So just leave it as negative. Then you bring the three forward and you subtract it by one. So three t squared, right? And this is not t prime, this is just t1. So since it's just t1, you can just get rid of the one. And then when you simplify this, you have 12t minus 3t squared. And that's your velocity, right? Or in other words, that's your dy over dt. Okay. And it's asking you, what's the velocity at t equals 2? So you just have to sub it in now. So s prime 2 equals 12 to minus 3 to square equals 24 minus 2 to the power of 2 is 4. 3 times 4 is 12. So then you'll get 12. And remember the units. Very important. S is in meters per and T is in seconds. So derivative is meters over seconds, right? So you have meters over seconds here. Only for the derivative of position. The derivative of acceleration you have meters square over second square, right? Or meters over second square because this y. So meters over second square, my bad. Acceleration is meters per second square, right? Okay. So now that I took the derivative of velocity, now can you take the double derivative? So do s prime prime t. So s prime prime t. So that means it's the derivative of this. So take the derivative again. Same rules apply. You're using the power rule, right? And the constant multiple rule and the difference rule. Same three laws again. So I'll give you some time, right? We'll take it up at, uh, so figure out the acceleration, the, the equation for the acceleration. So S double prime T. And then also figure out the acceleration at t equals two. So sub in two at the end. So I'm gonna give you maybe like two minutes, 11.20, then I'll take it up.
Okay. So it is 11.20. I'm going to take it up now. So we have, um, so we're going to take the S double prime T. So we're going to take the derivative of this function, the velocity function. We're working on the acceleration function right now. So we have, sorry, this function. Well, it's the same thing. It's just simplified. So first up, we have 12t, right? So if we have 12t, if you do the power rule with t, right, over here, you have t to the power of 1, right? If you bring 1 to the front, you have 0 as the new exponent, right? The exponent, when anything's to the exponent of 0, it's just 1. So that means it's just going to be 12, right? And then you do the same thing. Uh, you bring the two over. So you have three times two, and then you just have T, right? So then your answer is just gonna be 12 minus six T. That's your equation for acceleration. And then you have to sub in T equals two. So that means you would get 12 minus six, two. So that's just going to equal zero. It's zero acceleration. Okay. Um, so at what time does the object, is the object at rest? So how do you determine that? When something's at rest, the velocity is zero. So you could use this function and set it equal to zero and figure out what time, solve for t, right? So do s prime t equals zero, right? And then when you have s prime t equals zero, you can just write the function. So 12t minus 3t squared equals zero. Then you bring the negative 3t squared to the, you could, you could factor it too. You can just say uh, t, or actually I could factor it by 3t. So 3t, so I'm gonna get four minus um, just t, right? equals zero. And remember, you know how to do this. So you do, you equal each factor by zero. So three T equals zero. That means T equals zero. So at the beginning, it's at rest. And when you bring it to the other side, T equals four. So T equals four and T equals zero is when it was at rest. Okay. So these are the times in which the objects at rest at T equals zero and T equals four. Okay, so in which direction is the object moving at t equals five? Okay, which direction is the object moving at t equals five? So the thing about uh, velocity, acceleration, and position, they're just not magnitudes, right? They're vectors. They have, they have a sign, right? And they have direction associated with it. So right now, all the values are positive. So who knows, maybe the object will, can turn negative at a point, right? So it's asking when t equals five, what direction is the object moving? Whenever you think about what direction is the object moving, you look at velocity again. Is it moving forward? Is it moving backward? You look at velocity, you don't look at position. Position really doesn't tell you anything. If I'm saying that, how fast am I traveling? Or like what direction am I, am I moving? and I say that I'm in Mississauga, it's useless. It doesn't tell you anything. That's just my position. But if I tell you that I'm moving 100 kilometers per hour um, west, then you know what direction I'm moving in. I'm moving west, right? So you look at velocity again. So you look at velocity and you see what direction, what, what's the sign of the uh, number, right? It could be positive or negative, that will indicate whether if it's going left or right. It, they didn't really specify direction here. So you could just use the, whether if it's positive or negative to get a sense of the direction, right? So we're gonna sub in t equals five in our velocity equation. Okay, so this is for part C, right? So we are subbing t equals five into velocity equation. velocity equation, right? So t equals five. So all we're doing here is we're going to sub in. So s prime five equals 
12 T minus three T squared. So that's just going to be 12 five minus three five squared, right? So that's just going to be uh, 60 minus five times five is 25. 25 times three is 75, so negative 75. And so we're getting a negative 15 meters per second. So we know we're going in the negative direction. So in which direction is it moving in? Moving in the negative direction. That's the answer for C. When is the object moving in a positive direction? So all you have to see is when does velocity equal zero, right? So usually when it equals zero, it has to go through zero to change direction, right? So from zero to four, it looks like it was in the positive direction, right? Because when we looked at t equals t at two, it's positive. So that means it's getting lower and lower and lower, getting closer to zero as t equals four. And then past t equals four, we get a negative um, velocity. So we could say that between t equals zero and four, the velocity was positive. Right? And then for E, when does the object return to its original position? Okay? The original position is when, um, when you plug in zero, right? That was the initial position. So for E, we have to plug in zero to figure out what the original position is. It looks like it's going to be zero because there's t's in both of them, both terms. So it's gonna equal zero. So that means you have to figure out when it can equal zero again, right? So it's saying that st equals, so you write the equation, 6t squared minus t cubed, right? And this has to equal zero. Is there another way that this will equal zero ever again? Will it? So let's factor it, let's see. So t squared equals six minus t, right? And so we can see here that if we equal this to zero, t is equal to zero again. And then here, if we equal this to zero, t equals six. So that means at t equals six, it will reach its original position again. Will be back to its original position. Okay, so that makes sense. So yeah, that's just one application question from calculus. Okay, so let me give you another one. Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can find another question. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So Do a couple. So, okay, let's do this one. Question number five in your textbook. Okay, so I'll give you maybe three minutes, four minutes to answer this question, and then I will take it up with you. Okay.
Uh, Rami, did you finish the question? Yeah. Are you done? Okay. So, so here we determine the particle's velocity and the acceleration. So what does this mean? You determine S prime T, right? So we first multiply three, you use power rule. I mean, we are using difference and additional rule, right? Sum rule, addition rule, right? And we look at each term separately. First, we bring the three over, multiply it, right? So we get three, um, three, one over three T square minus four T plus three because the constant multiple rule, right? And power rule, so if you have one, you bring it over and you subtract it, you get zero. T to the power of zero is one. So you get rid of the T, right? Here, we are getting um, the threes cancel out. So we just have T squared minus four T plus three. That will be your equation for S prime T, right? Now let's do the double derivative. So S prime prime T. So you take the derivative of this, 2t minus 4. And then if you have a constant, it always turns to 0, right? So now you have both your equations. You sub in. Uh, so these are the, this is the equations for both velocity and acceleration. So A is done, OK? B, when does the motion of the particle change direction? So how do you tell this? It has to go through 0 to change direction, right? So we can say S prime T equals zero. So zero equals T squared minus four T plus three, right? So this is a simple trinomial. We just use standard factoring, right? T, T, uh, negative three, negative one, right? So has to multiply to three and has to add to negative four T. You use the butterfly. And then we will get uh, t minus uh, one, t minus three as the factored form, right, for s prime t. Now I can equal them to zero. So this equal to zero, this equal to zero, that means I'll get t equals one and t equals three, right? These are the two times where it will pass zero. So this is where it will change direction. T equals one and T equals three is when it will change direction because it's passing through zero, right? When does the particle return to its initial position? So we just take our original position function, ST equals uh, one over three T uh, square cube minus two T square plus three T. And we need to make sure that it equals, um, so when we sub in zero, the initial position, we will get zero, right? So when does it become zero again? Is basically what it's asking, right? So zero equals negative, oh, sorry, not negative. It's just one over three T cubed minus two T squared plus three T. We can factor out a T, right? T um, <clears throat> yeah, we can factor out a T. We can multiply every number by three to get rid of the, um, uh, the fraction coefficient. So we could do that. Multiply all the terms by three. We're just going to get uh, T cubed minus six T square and um, plus nine T, right? And now um, I'm gonna factor out a T. So t equals t square minus um, 60 plus 9. This looks really close to um, what's it called? A difference of square situation, right? It looks pretty close. Um, so t, t, uh, two numbers that multiply to positive 9. So negative 3, negative 3, but add to negative 6. So we have t t minus three square right so here when we equal it to zero we know when it's uh t equals 
So when we solve for it, right, we just say we equal each term by zero. So that means t equals zero and t equals three. So t equals three is when it will return back to its original position. Does that make sense, Rem? Do you have any questions? I don't have any questions. Okay, sounds good. Um, all right, looks good. So let's look at maximum and minimum interval values, right? So when we check our understanding for max and min, let's uh, look at this post, Oops, sorry. My bad, I don't know what happened here. I to do the same app. Um, oh yeah, because we continued off applications, right? Okay, yeah, so um, algorithm for finding maximum or minimum extreme values. So I'm just going to paste. Okay. So here we have um, an algorithm for finding maximum or min extreme values, right? If a function has a derivative at every point in the interval, right? So let's say this is our function, right? We know if we take the derivative and we set it equal to zero, this is basically when the function, the derivative, the derivative is slope, right? So whenever we take a derivative of a function, we're finding the slope at different points, right? And obviously, when the derivative is zero, we have a max and min, right? Because the tangent of a max and min point is zero. So this is basically saying that. So whenever we take a derivative of a function and set it equal to zero and figure out when it does equal zero, that will give us at what point is the max and min occurring. Right? So for example, and then this is also um, for finding maximum and minimum. This is basically the maximum and minimum extreme values. What does extreme values mean? That means it's like, the it's for sure the maximum and minimum of the entire function, right? So for example, here um, in this case, if we're finding a max, so you know how in general when you have functions, you can have multiple, right? Like loops. The absolute or extreme values is basically the maximum for sure. Like whenever we have, let's say a function like this, or sorry, not a point. Um, let's say if it goes down, goes up, goes up, and then goes up again, and then goes like this, this is the maximum and this, or let's say if this was lower, this is the minimum, right? So that's what extreme values mean. It has to be for sure the maximum or the minimum zero, or like when the derivative is equal to zero on the graph, okay? You'll find local minimum and maximas too, and we'll figure out how to get those as well. So let's say if we want to find the extreme values in a function like f of x equals negative two x cubed plus nine x squared plus four, right? So what do we need to do? We need to get the derivative and set it equal to zero. That's essentially what we need to do. Take the derivative of this function that's going to equal negative six x squared plus 18 x, and that's it, right? The constant is zero. We set this equal to zero. So then we need to solve for x now, right? So here we could factor out an X, right? We can factor uh, six, right? Or negative six in general, negative six X. Then we'll just have X net minus uh, three, right? Equals zero. Then we know that X will equal zero or X equals three will also equal zero, right? If I put X equals zero in here, it'll equal zero. Put X equals three in here, it'll also equal zero. So these are the two values where it will equals, where it will equal zero, right? So now all I have to do is sub in these points into this equation to figure out what that max or min value is, because this is telling you 
where that maximum and minimum occurs, like the X value, right? But you need to plug it in to see what that maximum or minimum value actually is. So I'm going to sub in zero into my original function. That's four, so it should equal four, right? And then if I also put three, I'm going to get negative two, uh, three cube plus nine, three square plus four equals negative two to the power, three to the power of, sorry, three to the power of three is 27, right? And then we have um, nine times nine, right? So 81, and then we also have plus four, right? So we're gonna get 31, okay? All right, um, also, let's say if these values, I'll make another point. So for example, let's say this function is on an interval. Let's say between x is an element of all real numbers between negative one and five, excluding. So remember the, the square brackets is excluding, right? That point in general but we should always test those edge cases as well, right? So let's say for example, yeah, so we would always also find the Y values at these boundaries as well. So let's do that. So F at negative one, right, is negative one, yeah. Negative one will be negative two, negative one cubed plus nine, negative one square plus four. So that's just going to equal 15, okay? And then we also have F at five, which is going to be negative two, five cubed plus nine, uh, five square plus four, and that's going to equal negative 21. Okay, so now we have all the values. So now we have to figure out what the absolute maximum or minimum is, right? So the absolute maximum is the 31. The absolute minimum is the 21. So x equals three, maximum, x equals five, minimum. And that's it. So that's how you solve the problem. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions? Yeah. Why do you find the values for, for the interval? So because we don't, so let's say for example, like in this case, right? In this case, we found the local maximums and minimas, but in reality, this is actually the minimum point, right? And this is actually the maximum point. So we have to consider that case as well. So when we 